second open mic already. We had one last month, and we're back now in June again with a, with a great keynote to start with and uh, an expert panel to follow. Uh, this is a co-organized event um, by Switzerland Innovation Park, Basel area. Uh, for those of you who do not know, we run an office here on Novartis campus focused on digital health ventures. And we do this together with Day One uh, Healthcare Innovation, an open innovation platform for digital health and medtech. Before I hand over to my colleague Anka, I would like to mention that we have again a Mentimeter running. There will be the QR code visible on the screen. So on site and online, everybody is welcome to uh, get into Mentimeter and raise their question, which the moderator of the session will then take up and bring in throughout the session. But now happy to hand over to Anka, please. Thank you, Rahel. Thank you for the great introduction and a warm welcome from Day One Healthcare Innovation as well. I'm Anka Del Rio, Health Tech Community Lead at Day One, and I'm so happy to have so many familiar faces with us today, but also to welcome the new ones and our new partners from Israel with the full house delegation. Um, I cannot wait to tell you more about it, but I'm not going to spoil too many details. I let you discover it step by step. Um, I just want to take a short dive into the topic that we are going to address today because it's quite controversial and we're talking about patient engagement for several years now. But the question today is, are we doing things right? Have we made any progress? What is the status and what is the status quo in industry and healthcare practice? Are we really walking towards putting the patient in the center or in the driving seat? Are we properly innovating across the continuum of care and working together for better patient outcomes, better patient experience? This is why today we're going to have with us an expert panel who's going to represent the voice of the industry, um, meaning the corporates and life sciences industry to that extent. We're going to have the voice of the startups. We're going to have as well as the voice of the hospitals as we are going to really assess if they are doing the things right, if they are engaging the patients in the right way. But with this being said, I don't want to take any more of your time and put the spotlight on our special and distinguished guest today who traveled all the way from Israel. You probably all heard the name beforehand, mostly in the pandemic, unfortunately, uh, Professor Ronnie Gamzu, who is going to have a wonderful keynote around the topic that I just told you about, but also about the advances that are being currently made in Israel and Tel Aviv in their fantastic hospital. We cannot wait to hear more about it. Thank you so much. And don't forget to engage in the end also in Q&A. He's going to join again in the end, the stage, to just um, address any of the questions and queries. Thank you very much, and welcome, Professor Gamzo. Anka, th thank you very much for this nice presentation, introduction, and uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm coming from uh, the Tel Aviv Medical Center in Israel, and uh, we are all talking about, we are gathering about innovation, innovation in healthcare. And for me, innovation is trying first to close the gap from other industries. First, humbly acknowledging that healthcare is lagging behind other industries in technological advancement and innovation. We still are doing practices in an old fashioned way. You are talking about patient engagement. Yes, we have a problem there. We do not use the best technologies in order to engage. But this is not only about patient engagement, it's about all our industries. We need to fuel in and to go ahead and to use more data in order to make medical services smarter, faster, more accurate, tailor-made. And this we need to acknowledge first. We need to acknowledge that our Smart industry is not the most advanced. When we are comparing it to other industries that have done the huge advancement in the last 20, 30 years, healthcare that was a leading industry is still lacking innovation. And in order to push forward, we need all healthcare organizations, all stakeholders 
in our industry to face it, to acknowledge it, and then to do what it takes. And what it takes? First, to change the culture. We need to change the culture in healthcare organizations, hospitals, HMOs, clinics, insurance companies, sick funds, change the culture there. The CEO, the management, all of them needs to understand that and to push the culture to reinvent the way that we are practicing, the way that we do diagnosis, the way that we do physician-patient encounter. Anything that we are doing is kind of an old-fashioned. It's sometimes when I'm saying that, people really get embarrassed, people fight it, people do not acknowledge it, do not accept it. However, the first, the key factor to a change is acknowledging that. In any place, a, a physician that is working in the emergency room, a nurse that is taking vital signs, anything should, we, uh, should be changed. And the key factor as well is using the data. We are acknowledging, we have a lot of data, we are storing the data, but we do not use it. We do not use big data AI system in order to do decision support for our caregivers all around. So this topic now, we are focusing about patient engagement. Well, you know what, patient? Well, our customers are more or less passive customers. They are getting the treatment, they are getting the diagnosis, they are getting something, they know there is something, but they just do not participate enough. We do not bring them in. We do not attract them to our challenge. It's a huge challenge to diagnose, to treat, to make your health better, but we do not use them. They are, we use kind of a passive customers. So in order to en encourage them, to engage them, we need to go ahead. There's a barrier of asymmetry of information, of knowledge. Yes, the provider knows much more than the patient. And this gap, we must bridge the gap. The only way to engage them is bridging the gap, giving them, giving them the responsibility, the accountability, making them more responsible. And this, you need to give tools, digital tools. You know, you are using a lot of digital platforms in many other industries. You are taking responsibility. You are navigating your car. You are taking responsibility. You are taking responsibility. You are planning your transportation, your, 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 your trips. You are taking responsibility. You do not need agents no more, tourist agents no more. You are taking responsibility. You are engaged in many other industries. Why not in healthcare? Why not in healthcare? It's too complex? Yeah, people will tell you it's too complex. Second, there is too much dominance and sacred about physicians. They know more than us. It's very complex. We need them. We must rely on them. Yes, but not entirely. You can understand within your own power, within your own mind, you are doing that in many other occasions. You are buying with the, through the internet, you are doing retail, virtual retail, using many platforms that you didn't use 15 years ago. Now, it's a habit. Patient engagement, 10 years from now, could be the same. And you know what? We will treat our customers, the patient, much better. They know much better. They are there all the time. They will monitor themselves. They do not need to wait to the next physician encounter. And once they will do the feedback, change the medication, redose the medication, or stop the medication, understand that there is a side effect, then we will increase quality. We will be more precise, faster, smarter in the way that we treat our patient. They are not stupid. They are smarter than us. They know better about their body. We just need to bridge the gap. Sometimes it's a gap of arrogance because we physicians, many of the healthcare workers say, look at the patient and say, no, I cannot rely on him. You can, we should.
This is my speech. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gamzo. This has been truly inspiring, and I'm sure that we can build so much upon that. Um, with no further ado, I will now introduce our fantastic panels and let you dive into the topic even deeper, starting with our moderator, Maria Han from Nutrix. <laughs> Moving forward with Gonzalo Linares from Novartis. Thank you. Belinda von Niederhäusen from the Digital Health Companion. Yeah. <laughs> and last but not least, representing the healthcare provider voice, Florian Fischer from the Hospital de la Tour. <laughs> Thank you for joining. And Maria, I let you to it. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, this is a big pleasure for me to welcome you. Uh, sitting, but uh, still very nice to see you all uh, in this beautiful building, in this beautiful day. And I think the topic is also of uh, interest for all of us, the patient engagement in a practice and in the industry. We have a great mix of uh, panelists and we will be looking at this from different angles because I think that's also what will be interesting here today, that we have a startup perspective, the digital health perspective, hospital perspective, big pharma. So we can really talk today what works, what we can improve, as uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Gamzo started, uh, what technologies we can use to increase the patient engagement, and how we can also collaborate together. We also have, as you saw, the QR code for you. We also want you to be engaged and uh, send your questions so that we can also address them at the end of this panel. So just to break the ice, I would like to ask uh, our uh, panelists to introduce themselves, uh, tell you a little bit uh, about their background, and also just to start diving into our topic, uh, what the patient engagement mean for their industry, for their sector, and uh, how they see this also. So this will be a little bit like a startup uh, pitch uh, setup, so we will have uh, three minutes uh, for per person, and then we we start with the questions <laughs> and discussion. Belinda, yes, please. Uh, to me, great. Yes. Startup. <laughs> Never done a startup pitch before, but uh, it's very nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Belinda von Niederhäusen. Um, I'm the chief product officer for DHC. Sometimes I would love it to be the chief patient officer. Actually, it's uh, it's what my passion is about. DHC is a small medtech um, startup based in Germany, and we are in the space of rare diseases. So we develop digital health solutions for patients with a rare disease and their care teams. And um, for today, I was really reflecting about what does patient engagement mean in our case and, um, and how it impacted the work we do and the company who we are. And the first fact really is we wouldn't exist without working with the patient community because at the beginning, uh, we try to understand from a very specific uh, patient community, in this case, it's the spinal muscular uh, patient community, what their needs are. What are your pain points in your daily life, right? There are therapies out there, but there's still so many struggles that these patients have to, um, to go through. And we identified a lot of pain points, but we also identified a lot of solutions that could address these needs. Um, and one of them happened to be digital. And, um, you know, we said, let's do this together. We worked with a community of patients, caregivers, and we said, let's develop an app, and that's how the company was born, really. <laughs> so we created a company, that's fact number one. And ever since, we've really tried to work with um, patients, but also caregivers who are extremely important in this case, since those are mostly children affected, um, through every single step of the development of the solution. Um, from you know, prioritization, what needs to go in there through to the design, obviously. And we like to call it radical collaboration because it has to be radical. We had to pa have patients on the team. We had you know, SMA patients developing the app. We have a product manager who is a patient himself. This really makes your solution become valuable, adopted by the community, and meaningful. And the last bit was we thought about how do we create long-term solutions? Because we were looking at the patient sector, obviously, but also we wanted to understand what are the physician needs. Without having everyone at the table, without having 
something valuable for physicians, something valuable for patients and for our sponsors and co collaboration partners who are pharma companies, um, it wouldn't be something sustainable. So we created a steering committee actually with patient reps, with um, physician reps and with the pharma companies on board, bringing them all together to find the common denominator of what means value in digital health to all of you. And they are now overseeing our um, product strategy. So they're really advising us along the way. And to sum it up, you know, we're talking about patient engagement today. But to be honest, engaging to me is something rather unidirectional, right? These patients are the experts, especially in the rare disease space. I would rather call it and let us think about it patient partnership, right? Those are partners at eye level with us. And without them, we wouldn't be there where we are today. And I think that's a concept we should rather think about in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you want to, a yes. person from a corporate world to give an elevator yes. speech. Also, yes. It's going to be disappointing. Also. I have a 30 slide prepared for you all, <laughs> oh. approved. The rules are the 20 rules. steps, no. I'll try to do elevator speech if I can. Um, my name is Gonzalo. And um, when I was a child, I wanted to, not to work in patient engagement. I didn't know what uh, <laughs> that was about. I wanted to be a journalist. And this is why I dedicated the first years of my life up to the moment I went to the uni. I worked in radio stations and I really, really enjoyed it. But then when I was 24 years old or something like that, I discovered by chance, randomly, the world of healthcare. I started to work in a company that was uh, driving an awareness uh, campaign uh, for patients, for people living with uh, breast cancer. And I absolutely loved it. Working with the patient community, uh, they say people living with diseases, they don't call themselves uh, patients, is something that uh, has made an impact in my life. And uh, since that moment 20 years ago, I decided to dedicate my life to this. So before telling you what I do right now, I'm going to, to tell you a story just to, just to bring it to life. My father. My father um, had, like five or six years ago, one disease that is called neuropathic pain. I don't know if any of you uh, knows it. It's extremely painful, right? It's a nerve that is broken. And what I've read is that the pain is similar to an electroshock, just to give you an idea about what is this about. And of course, I wanted to help my, my father. So I made some research, who is there, doing some uh, projects, clinical trials, so that my uh, father could participate in one of these. Uh, I found one, and uh, I read the protocol, so how the, the clinical uh, trial is going to be conducted, and I found that they were expecting the patients, the people living with neuropathic pain, to uh, note their uh, pain scale on a daily basis through an app. And my father was perfect target for this clinical trial. He was in uh, his 70s in that moment. But imagine the moment of somebody in the, somewhere in the north of Spain where my dad is from. First, my dad didn't have a cell phone. My dad didn't have an app. Mm. My dad was not going to note uh, his uh, pain every single day. So I asked myself, has this company ever asked a person live it, living with neuropathic pain what is the best experience in a clinical trial? I don't know the answer. What I know is that the clinical trial was delayed mm -hmm. because they were uh, uh, spending time uh, recruiting uh, participants and they didn't get them. So this is what I, I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I try to bring these questions uh, to my uh, colleagues in uh, R&D, uh, in the commercial organization Anovatis, to bring the best possible medicines for people like my father. And I think uh, to the point of uh, this um, uh, presentation, the world is changing. The world of patient engagement is changing. We have an opportunity, opportunity now to engage with uh, people living with different conditions on a systematic way early on so that we can uh, 
build the best possible uh, medicines for all of them. Mm. And I'm very keen to hear your uh, opinions and thoughts today. So we have a very interesting uh, panel because this is the direction the world is going to. So thank you. Looking forward to that. Very inspiring. Uh, thank you for sharing this story. Mine is a little different. Uh, I work for Hôpital de la Tour in Geneva. I'm the Director for Innovation and Strategic Partnerships because we believe that innovation comes through the partnering of different uh, institutions, pharma, medtech, but also payers and, of course, patients. And when I was asked what is patient engagement for um, healthcare providers, I realized this is more than 400,000 interaction between a healthcare professional and a patient every year at our hospital. Be it an inpatient, be it a patient coming for an outpatient treatment, for prevention, for rehab. And this is where patient engagement takes place on a daily basis, multiple times a day in, in a healthcare facility. And at the same time, I couldn't agree more with the presentation of Professor Gamzu just before. There is a huge need of cultural change when it comes to patient mm -hmm. engagement in their own care and in the way we bring their care to them. And this is also an acknowledgement that we need to have, but also a change in culture with the patients. Um, of course, professionals have a <clears throat> big opportunity to change the way they view it, but they need to bring the patient along this journey. And one way of doing this, of course, is during the physical um, appointment that a patient has multiple, ta multiple times through the, the healthcare journey, but also in a digital way. So we are developing a, a patient engagement app that is supposed to be the virtual phase of Latour when patients are not here, so that they can follow up on their health objectives, the discussions, the personalization of medicine that we'll have discussed with the physicians when they're physically at the hospital, with time and when they're not uh, with us physically. And this, for example, allows us to gather a lot of um, data, a lot of um, you know, quantitative data that you can get from different sources, but also qualitative data. And, and we believe in a world where uh, healthcare would be paid for value, the so-called value-based healthcare, where you would get better outcomes for patients by giving them the best treatment that they deserve. And this relates, of course, to their own quality of life and their own objectives for their health. And this is also what we want to, to monitor and engage the patients to do with us in terms of patient reporting outcome measurements and the follow-up over time of these results. Excellent. This is, uh, you know, like I, I was really looking forward to this discussion when I saw the profiles of all the participants. Maybe a little bit also from my side. Um, I'm the founder of the digital health startup and we focus on the chronic diseases. And when we first launched our solution that integrates the data from multiple devices, integrates this and then provides the support from the doctors, when we first launched the, the very MVP version, we realized that the patient needed more, no? Because the patient felt like, oh, I don't know where I am on the journey. And uh, they were like, oh, I don't know what to do, no? And, and uh, with this, we launched additional tools, like, for example, the coaching through the WhatsApp. A very, very straightforward uh, thing. And we realized that that's the channel that the patients are using. Even though we have the app, there was a need for some additional uh, channel where they, we could communicate with the users. And just recently, we also launched the uh, chat GPT functionality for the questions trained with the medical team and our artificial intelligence uh, team so that we can also provide these quick uh, answers to the, to the questions of the patients. We had in the past the functionality of the questions that were answered by the medical team and now we also engage in this way, you know, that whenever they have the question about their treatment plan, they can very quickly ask also our digital assistant and the digital coach. So I think, uh, let's say, like, now, like, as, as we know, like, in which areas uh, you are, and I added also the, the area from where I am coming, what I would like to discuss as a next step is what are the successful tools and what are, because I think like also for, for our audience, this would be interesting, what 
what is working now where you saw that uh, you had like the success uh, from the engagement what kind of tools and ways of engagement uh, you had you have and you maybe will have very soon and also how do we really say that you know like okay this is successful what's the kpi of the success how do we measure the success on the patient engagement no like and and how do we really invest more resources in the solutions that really provide value so this is let's say like what i i would like to us to let's say like start creating for our audience maybe a list of uh, takeaways uh, that could be implemented in uh, different uh, are areas of, of health uh, as, as we have here on the panel. And maybe I will ask you, Gonzalo, to yeah. start. I can go first, no problem. <laughs> Things that have worked well, um, engaging early, right? When we start working on a project, even before the kickoff, we start thinking about what is going to be the perspective of people living with a specific uh, condition. Then I would say co-creation rather than seeking input. So not going to the person living with a condition with the product already cooked and say, hey, what do you think about this? It's like, oh, this is too, too late, mm. right? And um, I would say the third thing is it's a, a culture thing, right? A culture aspect, being very humble, right? We in pharma and uh, perhaps uh, some of you also work in uh, other uh, sectors close to, to ours, we believe that we know everything. And I think we just need to pause and ask the right questions from the beginning to the people that are the final users of our medicines. And Gonzalo, what would be those uh, early activities on this engagement? So, I would say my favorite one mm -hmm. is, for instance, for pharma and in the startup world will be different probably. When we think about R&D research, yeah. the first world research, that we ask these questions at the beginning, what is going to be the future need in 10 years? Mm. And it's, it's a difficult question to answer, right? So imagine there is a landscape right now of different treatments in one therapeutic area, but from research to development to commercialization, this can be 10, 15 years. Mm. So we have to anticipate future needs and we have to be very humble. And if a person living with a condition is telling us, no go, don't go that way, we just need at least to reflect on why. Mm. Absolutely. And, and Belinda, how do you see this uh, from, from the startup world? Yeah, I think I've been longer in pharma than in startups, but um, I could also from the startup perspective um, just echo what you said. I think what works well is engaging early and then engaging systematically and co-creating with the community. I think what is tough sometimes is really understanding who you need to talk to, like understanding the community that you talk to and um, it could be that a patient who is, let's say, a lay patient but knows a lot about his daily life can give you great insights and can work with you on, for example, a digital companion that, you know, supports this, his daily life. Mm -hmm. But there might be some very strategic discussions that you need to find the right expert for. And it could be a patient representative from a patient organization. So there are so many levels of expertise in your community that you need to understand who would be the right um, person to talk to. And I think in the startup world, it doesn't take as long as in pharma, obviously, to develop a product, but sometimes that means that you um, are too fast. You're moving too fast. You make decisions too quickly. You are losing your co-creation partners sometimes on the way. Um, and I think that's where we can get better, really interacting continuously, having standing formats where you talk with each other like you are on the same team. Um, that's something that I think we can improve on, yes. And this for you, in your case, is uh, both with the parents and with the, with the patients. Exactly. And in, in case of the hospital, uh, do you also engage uh, with the uh, uh, parents or only with the patients? Or 
Uh, I mean, in, in general, I think we at a hospital, we had a very different time scale. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the next uh, 10 to 15 years in terms of their needs. It's their needs today. Usually when they come and, and seek um, you know, acute care, they've been living with the condition for quite some time and they need a, a response now. Um, and, and I think for me, the, the biggest success factor is empathy. Mm -hmm. Because this patient engagement happens in an interaction between a professional and a patient. And then in this context, if you fall into the paternalistic uh, bias that unfortunately many healthcare professionals do have still today, then you will not really listen to the patient. You will not listen to the needs, you will not listen to the objectives, to what they want in terms of their quality of life. And this is where bringing some empathy, some really the will to listen to this person and, and understand why this person has come to, to see you respect the pain they're describing, the symptoms mm -hmm. they've been having, etc., will make that this patient feels respected and engages in the, the adherence of the care, but also in the, in, in the education that is often required to understand why they're having what they have, why, what are the therapy choices that they have, etc. And in the case of, uh, of pediatrics, because we also have a pediatric unit, of course you need to engage with parents. Uh, you can't go directly with the, with the patients, but you need to handle parents as parents and not as patients. Um, also have some empathy with the emotion, but not get into the parent bias, which will often let you believe that your child is really the, the worst case that could happen and, and the fear of you know, your child having something very, very grave. And, and I think this is a very different way of handling these emotions than if you would with a, with a patient that inherently feels the, the problematic is coming up with. Yeah, that's, uh, that's you know, like, uh, yeah, very, very uh, interesting to hear also, like, you know, like how, how different is the perspective. Yeah. And uh, for us, you know, like, I, I think we engage very much with the patients as the users mm -hmm. and uh, very much from the digital perspective. And then this uh, creates, you know, the list of uh, the wish list and uh, then we select uh, what goes for the next sprint, no? Uh, <laughs> what will be then, okay, like what solutions we will build and how we will improve our solution. I, I wanted to ask you, like, you know, like coming back to these tools, no? And evaluation, what is successful? How, like, w what are you really using and, and, and how this looks uh, in, for you? And, and also, you know, like coming back to what the professor said, uh, are we really using, no, like the latest of the technology? Because, like for example, this morning I was at the breakfast with Microsoft on the OpenAI and the ChatGPT, and it's like also, you know, like there was a, a topic, no, like no, like maybe not for drugs development, no. So I would like to also hear, okay, like how how we can really make use of of, of those latest technologies and improve the processes and and also like yes go back again to, to okay those tools and what's really successful and what didn't work maybe i can start because i think in when you're a healthcare provider technology is not always your best friend and and i love technology obviously but it's not always what's best for the patient right now and and as gonzalo was saying earlier if you're an elderly patient if you have you know have the life that you've had, then you might not be willing to get the most technological notch in the interaction you have with your um, with the healthcare professionals you you will be handled with, and and I think making sure that we we get the right level of technology to reach the needs to maximize the needs and that we don't shoot with a canoe on on a, on a fly, it's very important because I mean there is so much technology out there we could do like incredible things, and sometimes just a two minutes video of my physician explaining what is atrial fibrillation, that I can watch again, that I can show to my parents, that I can show to my wife, that I can show to everybody so that they all know they have the same level of understanding than I do, and this is a video that I trust because it was made by my physician or, 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 or trust by my physician. That's already enough, and I mean, this is nothing more than just YouTube that's been around for years. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that we 
take the best possible technology, if we talk about you know, DOR, or if you look at security in the rooms and safety, etc., then you can go a very long way with technology. And in some aspects, you can remain also very simple to still make very meaningful innovation. Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, the part of impact and how to measure impact, that's a big question for all of us. It's not so straightforward. I'll tell you my ideal world and then the reality. In the ideal world, working in a company like Novartis or Roche or any other of these big players, I would love to conduct a clinical trial, one group with uh, patient engagement, with engagement of the patients, and the other without it, and see the result. And I bet you that if we are able to do that, we'll see that the first group engaging with the uh, people living with different conditions will run faster. And running faster in a clinical trial means a lot. Mm. means that we'll bring the medicine faster for patients. It's also uh, good for the pharmaceutical companies, of course. So that would be the ideal world. There are some data available out there comparing somehow the difference between engaging with patients and without engaging with patients. There are some qualitative data. Um, and then also on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, in uh, Anovatis, we, we have, for instance, uh, ways of uh, measuring the behavioral change. So imagine uh, doing something, conducting a survey, then, uh, sorry, conducting the survey, doing something, doing a specific activity with patients, and then seeing the outcome with patients. How do you feel? Mm. Ha have we moved the needle some, uh, somehow? That's another way of doing it. And then the, the very simple other way of measuring it is just purely with patient satisfaction. Mm. Right? Do they feel um, great with the service medicine that uh, they have, um, they have uh, explored or work with uh, any of our um, partners in the pharmaceutical sector? So there are ways, but it's not absolutely there yet in terms of measurement. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add something because I think it's a great question and I would love to hear you know, from the audience if, if you guys have some suggestions. Um, I think that's the question that we struggle most with, especially due to mm -hmm. the reasons that you just mentioned. It's hard to compare, right? Mm -hmm. Doing mm -hmm. patient engagement here in the same setting versus not doing patient engagement. I think for digital solutions, it's um, maybe not easier, but you can become more precise because mm -hmm. in the end, um, engaging the patient community now, for example, in our case, um, how we measure it is um, based on adoption, really. Like, is the technology adopted? The biggest issue we have with technology in medicine is not that there is none, it's that it's not necessarily adopted by the system and people are not using it or don't like it. Um, so that's something where we clearly see if we engage with the communities and they become, like in any change management process, if you're engaged, they start to own the product, they love it, and they talk about it. And um, once they start doing that, it's much, much easier, we found, to have it implemented in practice. Um, and I think that's how we try to measure the success of the process, obviously, of, of engaging patients. But then in the end, also the, uh, the, the, the success of the solution. Mm. Yeah, this is, this is also similar for us. Like, at the end, the results are tangible, no? Like, on the, on the digital solution, because we have the laboratory test of the person that is entering the program and then we have really the information about yes what's the hemoglobin like oscillated three months after six months after nine months after you know and the same with the body weight so it's it's very let's say like tangible to see how engaged the person is on the program mm -hmm. and also like how the results are improving and and whether they are making what they were supposed to, to do, no? according to the uh, treatment plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think also, let's say, like, what we will add now is, like, let's say, like, what I mentioned, no? so that, that the patient really sees where they are and where they are heading also. I think this is also very important for the engagement to explain, as we discussed during the lunch, mm -hmm. no? like that, uh, to explain what are the treatment options for the person and then show, okay, like you can go or this way or the other. 
if possible, no? If there are the possible uh, differences in, let's say, like options for the treatment plan, because there are some, unfortunately, maybe diseases that we have only one or, 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 or we barely have one, no? That is uh, viable. But I think this is also what is increasing all this uh, engagement. But um, for me, like now, like to transition also a little bit to the collaboration topic, uh, I would like to ask you also, as we heard, like, okay, like what we do, how we do it, how we could then work together. Uh, it's a pity that we don't have on the panel the maybe the health insurance company that would be also beneficial to hear their perspective because it's like an empty seat, no? But <laughs> because at the end, we also know that statistically the patient engagement increased the adherence to the treatment plan, decreased the cost, and it's also, let's say, like a, a great solution for the preventive health. So let's say like this would be also interesting to, to see. But what I would like is, yes, to see like how, how we could um, collab collaborate together, how we could uh, increase this in engagement. Uh, yes, big pharma with the startups, no? or, or the big pharma hospitals uh, startups. Uh, what we could do together uh, to make it better for the patients. I can read a go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I really like the approach of thinking on the whole ecosystem, right? Mm. And we have here some representatives yes. of it, right? So whoever wants to be successful needs to think about we are operating in a complex system mm. where HEPs, healthcare professionals, are one part of it, but not only. Mm -hmm. We're talking about access players, regulatory bodies. Uh, nurses, essential nurses, mm -hmm. and the people living with, um, with these conditions, um, among others. So the first thing that I would do is really defining the problem we want to tackle, because we don't need all of them mm. for every single thing, right? Um, but it's very important to think uh, how we can partner together on something, what is the issue, who are the key players, and to uh, Belinda's point earlier about identifying who are the best people to give the advice, right? Because not everybody knows about everything. So I think uh, we are trying to do it in, uh, in the pharmaceutical sector. It's true that we are getting there. Uh, but I think it's something that we all should uh, explore and continue exploring. And, and uh, from your point of view, uh, how you know like how this is evolving and also like we we talked about the ecosystem no like the part let's say like the different players in the health ecosystem but don't you think we should also invite the partners from outside of the ecosystem let's say like yeah. the technology companies the yes for sure yeah yeah, yeah. there are actually there no. are multiple partnerships between uh, pharma and the and digital world, so it's, it's happening. Exactly, because like yes. as Novartis, you have a huge partnership with Microsoft. Exactly, right? like, for instance. For, let's say, like data processing mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. engagement, design of the, of the mm -hmm. new medicines. Yeah, that's happening. And I think we were also mm -hmm. talking about earlier, uh, is precisely if we move from where we were, just thinking that the doctor knows mm -hmm. Everything, the doctor knows a lot, but it's only a part of the uh, ecosystem, right? So it's a cultural transformation to your earlier point, mm. uh, thinking who else uh, can be there and giving input, like the people living with the different uh, conditions, right? So it's a, a big minds, uh, mindset change. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural transformation, thinking uh, that the people living with that disease is your final end user. And there, I think we can learn a lot from the consumer companies. Mm. I, I know it's shocking. It's shocking for a person coming from Novartis, <laughs> right? But let's look about how other sectors are engaging with their customers. Yep. How Tesla is doing it. Exactly. Yeah. How App, Apple is doing it, mm. right? We, we are limited in our framework, of course, but I think we can all learn from each other. Yes. And then also in our own ecosystem, we can learn all from the hospitals or from the mm -hmm. startup uh, sector. And this is, you know, like a nice transition to, to maybe a, a closing uh, question for the panel. How, you know, like, how do you see this uh, evolving? 
uh, because you've been like all of you know like for for years involved in in this uh, topic and how do you see how how it changed and what uh, wh how do you think it will evolve in the next few years and and uh, once again no coming back to to the technologies uh, to the documentation, to the data on the engagement, where where do you see your particular sector going? Yeah, maybe I think from, and it goes very much in what you were just saying, I think the fact that there are such panels, like today, the fact that we have these roles that exist, mm. yeah. uh, that didn't exist uh, a few years back, it, it shows that the, the, the world of healthcare is going in the, in the right direction. And I think we're going to go into more differentiation between health and care and between products and the delivery and the, and the follow-up of, of a solution for patients. And I think if you look at this as a matrix, uh, you will have more and more solutions to keep you healthy for a longer term. And then you will have people, healthcare professionals or others, that will help you through this journey that will have been not just a drug, not just uh, a device, but you know, a full-fledged solution, solution, as we can mm -hmm. learn from mm -hmm. other industries as well. And the same when you have a health problem, when you're sick or whatever. And then to say, okay, this is a solution that was thought for me. This is an entire patient journey that was built, and not just you know this drug plus this med tech device plus this healthcare professional kind of coming together, but really thought through. And then you know the people that will follow you all all through this journey. And I think if we manage to see healthcare as a, as a big mm. um, whole thing, then uh, this is how we're going to bring most value to patients in the future and most innovative mm. solutions. Totally agree with you. Uh, a few other thoughts. So first, um, where we are right now, mm. at least in Novartis, and I bet that it's going to be similar in different pharma. We have uh, now in place a patient engagement strategy for the first time. Uh, it was uh, initiated a couple of years ago by the head of patient engagement at Novartis, which, by the way, is coming from the patient community in the US. And uh, what we are doing right now is having this consistent uh, strategic, strategic and systematic engagement with the communities in every single key decision that we take. We are not there yet. Mm. <laughs> but we are definitely uh, moving forward in, uh, in that direction. Um, in terms of how I see the future, I see uh, that we'll get into personalized uh, healthcare. We were talking mm -hmm. about that mm -hmm. earlier at lunch. Uh, this is not going to be something that works for everybody. We need to segment to what works for every single individual, right? And I would envision partnerships exploring the, the potential of digital. I would love to learn more uh, and, and so in the future, thinking on how we uh, adapt it to our framework, which is highly regulated uh, and rightly so. Mm. I think um, the technologies that we um, have today, ChatGPT, you mentioned it, um, other technologies, like we're collecting so much data, we are able to collect so much data. We have ChatGPT who is, you know, it's explaining basically everything to me as a potential patient uh, it, in easy language, so that's great. Mm. I think these technologies really kind of elevate the patient voice or the empowerment of the patient so quickly because people start to understand what they have, how they can deal, uh, how they can, um, you know, look at their own health. Basically, I think what is needs to change is that we need to equip people how they use that knowledge and how they use the data they're gathering from their sensors, from their phones, and so on, so they can really make more informed decisions. And I think. That will be the new topic that we need to talk about. Health data has mm -hmm. been a topic forever. Personalized health has mm -hmm. been a topic for mm -hmm. some time. But really talking about who is the owner of the data. Am I, as a patient, the owner of the data? Mm -hmm. This voice will get stronger and stronger. What can I do with my data? And how do we create solutions, business models, and so on, where patients really are in charge of their own data? So that's like an interesting question. We tried to you know, address it in our solutions, um, but I think that's like a topic that we need to discuss uh, in the future to really find, um, to really give the power to the patient in the end. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I'm excited to see the future. Yeah, excited, <laughs> excited. Me, I'm excited also. And before we really open the questions from the public, just the final one. I wanted to ask you about your wish on what would you what you wish for in the patient engagement. If you know that like you will have a magic wand, what do you would you like to have tomorrow in this area? What would you wish for? To, to advance uh, in the innovation, to improve the uh, patient uh, treatment and, and, uh, and make it easier and, and make it better. What would you wish for? Is it the budget? Is it the process? Is it having more technology? What would you like to incorporate? I, I think a, a cultural reset button. Where I can take a person and say, cultural reset cultural reset, and also not only for healthcare professionals, not only for the industry, but also for patients. If you've had all your um, interaction with healthcare professionals as a very paternalistic uh, way, then when you're 70 and you come for whatever other reason, then you say, okay, just tell me what I have to do, you do whatever you want, I just relax, and then you take care of everything. Mm -hmm. So, cultural reset. Very good point. There's nothing to add. <laughs> cultural okay. reset. Is then, great. then, then, yeah. then we stay with the cultural reset. And then I think uh, from the cultural reset. Well, uh, first of all, I will ask maybe the technical team to open the questions because I was clicking here, but sorry, I was not able to see them. And uh, I will also invite now uh, to the stage uh, uh, Professor Gemzi to join us also uh, to the panel for the Q and A. Ah, exactly, I see, like, exactly. Up and down. Up and down, okay, perfect, thank you. Then we... Technology. <laughs> I think exactly, this is, this is, let's say, like, the first question is, uh, let's say, like, on the ending note, um, how can you expect mindset shift for patient involvement when... Ah, uh, here we have exactly, we have a, a very interesting question on the patient involvement. We focus on this uh, panel on the patient engagement. We did not uh, cover uh, the topic of the uh, patient uh, advocacy. Uh, I think we will have uh, a separate uh, topic on this uh, also. Uh, I think that like this question is very interesting because we did not touch this and I think it's like whenever we talk about the healthcare, whenever we talk about engagement in innovation, we need to touch also the topic of the uh, regulatory approval and regulatory authorities. So uh, let's take this one. Uh, why is patient engagement left uh, to us? What are the regulatory authorities doing, saying about this topic? they could just mandate companies to incorporate and consider it. So let's say like there is no mandate. So this is, I think, uh, a, a nice, nice question to cover because we did not cover this in the panel. So thank you for, for the author of this question. Let's, let's take this one. I can give it yeah. a go. Um, the world is changing also there. So we have FDA guidelines uh, asking the uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies to consider the patient perspective. EMA is doing the same. The same is happening in the UK, for instance. This is coming up. And uh, for instance, in the, in the UK, as far as I remember, is a pilot when uh, the pharmaceutical companies are submitting the dossier, uh, asking for uh, the regulatory uh, uh, approval. They ask, what is the engagement with the patient community that you have conducted? They clearly ask that. It's a pilot aiming to be uh, mandatory very soon. Mm -hmm. So it's, and actually is one of the key, one of the key drivers. It's not only to do the right thing. I believe uh, engaging with the patient community is doing the right thing, but everybody is going to ask it, starting uh, with the regulatory bodies. Maybe just to add also the regulatory bodies, both EMA, FDA, but also like the local bodies, they do have processes established where they have their own patient advisory boards yes. that look actually into the processes. So that is also happening. And I, for like a Swiss fund, for example, like funding body, yeah. um, I know that they are also asking hospitals now to um, engage patients when they create study protocols, for example, and otherwise you wouldn't get the funding. So there's loads happening from like a infrastructure process level as well. 
Yeah, which is which is really really great to hear. And then we also have a question more from the ethical side, and um, uh, which I believe it's also nice to touch. Uh, which is, is there a gender issue in the patient uh, engagement, and 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 how do we ensure you know, that we have let's say like at the end uh, a solution that fits uh, every participants no of the of the patient journey. Mm. I would love to get more uh, clarity on the uh, on the question. So details in terms of what do we mean with this uh, gender issue? In, in which way, right? If it's uh, people working in the uh, patient engagement uh, sector, or how we represent the, the 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 patient communities, I would perhaps elevate the question or the answer and think about diversity overall, which goes beyond the gender, yeah. is uh, ethnical background, etc. And um, we are working on it, and I don't think we are there yet in terms of representing all the uh, communities in clinical trials. Uh, for instance, uh, I work in, uh, in neuroscience, and one of the uh, panels, uh, patient panels that we have uh, for multiple sclerosis, the mandate I gave to the team is that it has to be diverse. And when I say diverse, it means uh, representing the Afro-American community uh, uh, in the US represent uh, Latin America, Middle East, so that we capture what is the patient need. It's never going to be universal because the, the healthcare sector is different and even the culture is different, right? The way we live some diseases is different in Japan than in uh, Germany. But we need we need to make the effort. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Diversity and inclusion, and not only consideration of the gender. Exactly. So, yes. And uh, then we have one question for you, Belinda. Uh, how are patient engagement strategies in the ecosystem changing the paradigm for rare diseases? How do we measure the improvement, if any? Hmm. Not sure if I understand the question correctly. But, uh, <laughs> um, so what I can say about the rare disease space specifically is that a lot of the best practices that we know in patient engagement, not for startups, but in general, are actually coming from the rare disease space, right? It's a very engaged community. It's a highly expert, a high, high expert community, often parents of children, as you can imagine, you know, when you have a child that is very ill and you don't necessarily know what it is and you're trying to find a diagnosis for years, you become the expert. It's not usually not the doctors, it's you becoming the expert. So a lot of what we've learned from great patient engagement comes from these communities who also really ask pharma, ask um, startups to, you know, to engage with them. They have established community advisory boards. They have always been the first ones kind of like engaging the other stakeholders in their needs. And I think that's already great. So I'm not sure how much it should change for like the better in the future. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we've already learned a lot from these from these communities. I think what could um, improve maybe is whenever therapeutic options come into the ecosystem, that's when communities really become stronger and, um, and mature because that's when they start to connect and start to interact with all the stakeholders, especially also pharma companies. I think there we could come become better at also engaging those communities that are maybe less mature and less connected because there are no therapy options available. So that's something that we've seen, for, like a trend that these communities would, you know, patient organizations and so on become much stronger when there are therapy options. Um, so maybe that's something to improve. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And and the last one, like well, the next question that I have here is. Uh, how can we put the center of the care if doctors have not even six minutes to talk to them? So it's like about the patients, no, like, and limited time. And this one I, I would really like to take because uh, it's, it's very close to what we are doing. And to be honest, we need to bring uh, efficiency. And, and I know that it's very sad to see this, that it's only six minutes per doctor, but we are very much present in Latin America. And for example, in Brazil, we have a situation where we have 16 million patients with type 2 diabetes and only 5,000 diabetes experts. So we have even bigger problem because we have 
70% of patients who are not following the treatment plan because simply or they cannot get to the doctor or they cannot follow up with the doctor and they don't really know what to do. So in my opinion, all these digital solutions that we have, I, they, they simply, let's say, like make this six minutes not so, uh, let's say, like... Uh, that the patient do not really feel that it's six minutes if there is engagement between the appointments. And that's the key. Because like at the end, this appointment do not really need to happen if we have all the coaching, all the communication with the patient, and the patient feels that, yes, we are uh, listening to you, we are taking care of you, you are not alone. So I, I in, let's say like, and it's on all the engagement that, the medical consultation is just, let's say, like one event or it happens or once a year or once every six months, but there is like so much time and so many different technologies that we can use in between so that at the end, when this consultation happens, this person doesn't really feel that it's this six minutes. So this is, let's say, like my I perspective. I couldn't agree more because in the example that I was bringing earlier on, on this video on fibrillant relation, that's the exact same thing. The physician came saying, I have only 20 minutes, and so yeah. not six, but still it's a limited time. And what I need to explain takes me about 15 minutes, so I have no time left for the patients. And what we did is that we filmed him, we put it in short videos by topic that covered what he would explain in a usual um, consultation with patients. He would send them the link to the app with the videos that would come up on every day so that they don't have to... Mm -hmm see it at once, and then they would come up with a question to the consultation. Yes. So the 20 minutes would be used completely differently than for patients that wouldn't have seen or before having the ability to see it um, earlier on. Yes, and this is exactly what we also do, like with the videos, with the links, with, let's say, like Q&As, and, uh, and then the, also the group sessions for the patients. Professor, uh, how, I how think, do you think uh, also? you're thinking in the regular way, in the classic way. So you're measuring the six minutes and you're saying, how can I in six minutes do that? And I'm saying, you do not need to do yeah, the same thing. Exactly. You first, many of your patients should not even Reach? be seen by you. Hmm. They could do anything. Hmm. Just take, for example, Amazon uh, uh, you know, site. There's no one body behind the counter there. So just imagine a different, a different approach. Don't th th this approach and saying, "Hey, I do not have enough time in six minutes to, to do patient empowerment." I'm saying, "Yeah, but you will need. We will have different technology that, that will be more powerful. Even in six minutes, or in ten minutes, or in twenty minutes, you will not." get the same effective empowerment that you may get in other technologies. Mm. So for me, this is the, the way to think. We yes. should change the way that we use to practice. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is like, let's say, like all the change of the uh, protocol, of the treatment plan for the patients. And, and then this consultation is on a completely different level because the treatment adjustment can be done in between the visits based on the real-time data from the patient. There's a question from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, so we don't need to, we don't take only the online. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Uh, I have two. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, what uh, Professor want to say, there is a change of paradigm, a disruption. That means soon with uh, sensors, with uh, information yes. that we will get, we will have a huge data and even 80% of the sickness will be diagnosed by chat GPT. Absolutely. That means the, the paradigm, that means today, uh, 20 years ago, we used to go to the doctor's office or uh, hospital now the health is going outside. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This 
Am I am I right? Yeah, yeah. I could, Thank you very much. Yes, I could you know, I could not agree more. <laughs> and this is this is what we do on the daily basis. So so and especially with the continuous monitoring of the patients, you can really predict this, and you can predict this to the level that you can send the message to the patient before the levels go very high in terms of the glucose or very low. Yes. So you can really make a. a prevention activities that the patient uh, really uh, gets better. So watch out uh, Tesla, watch out Apple. Yeah. Well, this is, this, this is also an, an interesting topic. It's, let's say, like the big companies are running before, uh, uh, after the, the digital health, uh, healthcare in overall. Let's, uh, you know, like, let's see. Uh, how 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 you see this uh, from from your side? I think we can definitely learn a lot from these kind of companies. Any consumer company, or, no, or at least the big ones, as you were saying, Tesla, Apple, Procter and Gamble, mm. big players there. If you asked me this question like five or ten years ago, I would tell you that at some point we'll see a company like Microsoft or Facebook in that moment, uh, buying a big pharma. Mm. And the more uh, time goes, I think the more difficult I see that happening because I'm learning, I'm learning a lot also every day and I see how, how complex, complex uh, healthcare is on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. But I definitely see a lot of opportunities for partnership and for change and for radical change. So imagine uh, I, I see some people here that have worked on digital recruitment, uh, putting the focus in, in a clinical trial on the potential participant, not only on the um, investigator. That can be a radical move, and probably we'll see it. There are many opportunities coming up for partnerships. And we have another question here yes. from the... Thank you for the insight, guys. Um, quick question about the trust. I think that you know, over the pandemic, there was a lot of things going on wrong for the industry. And what is your feeling about the patient trust in the industry and what we can do mm. about it? Oof. I get this question a lot from uh, insurance companies. How do they see the trust from their clients in, in the system? A little less about industry, and, and I think as a healthcare provider, uh, we have the, probably the, the easiest position when it comes to trust because it's really patient coming and seeking information. What we believe is changing is that they will not be satisfied with just one piece of information or one in piece of information coming from just one doctor. Uh, what we have uh, started doing more and more is these panels of doctors. If you come with a, uh, you know, you have pain in your hip, not just going to see a hip surgeon, you will see a panel that includes a GP specialized in, in sports medicine, uh, a surgeon, but also a physiotherapist, and, and maybe the radiologist has taken your image, and they will discuss together. And this you know, interdisciplinarity will give trust to the answer that is given, first of all because it's multiple people, but also because they will come up with different approaches. So it's not going to be your choices to get operated, not get operated, to get operated, or have you know, a conservative uh, functional approach, or um, you know, wait and see. And, and I think this creates a lot of trust, even in, in difficult times like COVID. Trust issue is in any industry, in any issue. Like, do you trust your navigation system? Do you trust buying on the internet? Do you trust, or will you trust, do you trust chat GPT? Will you trust? And an auto tech uh, or autonomic car, it, it's, it's a gradual issue. It's, you, you will first time when you will have system, a good system for patient empowerment, engagement, you will not trust it. You will call your doctor. Second time, you, maybe you will call your doctor once a week. And then you will not call your doctor. It's, it's, it's gradual. You know, when I'm buying an Amazon sports shoes, I really have a bad feeling that I'm going to fail. But, you know, gradually, I put my trust. Mm. So, 
I'm saying that because this is kind of a barrier. Mm-hmm. Cultural mind barrier, usually physicians are putting that ahead. Mm-hmm. There's no way it's going to work. Patient will not trust such tools. Don't believe that. The, 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 the industries are changing. Mm-hmm. Trust is not going to be a barrier. Mm-hmm. Maybe just to add another angle um, to trust what we um, observed during the pandemic when working with the community on digital solutions where you collect sensitive data about yourself, about your health, mm-hmm. this topic came up much more often. So how do we handle data? Who's handling the data? How are we, what can I do with it? How do I own it? Do I own it? Does someone else own it? Just to the question about, you know, big tech companies yes. or like um, someone else collecting a lot of data with a very obvious um, business model and that's completely okay, right? I mean, but that's something that I observed and I don't have an answer to it, but the the ask was much more about we, we only trust you if you're completely transparent about how you're handling the data, what you're using it for, who you're selling it to. Um, and I think that will be an interesting discussion when we have, or where well, we already have them, but the large companies who are you know, using the data, more and more and more data from us um, about our own health and how we find good models for everyone there in society and health. Yes, and we have maybe the, the last question uh, to Professor Gamzu. Uh, if you could share with us some use cases in patient engagement strategies deployed at your hospital and in Israel in general. I think the most important issue is patient reported outcome measure, PROM. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are doing hip replacement. Uh, The patient is discharged. The physician tells the residents, we have done a great surgery. Why? How do you know that? Because we put the prosthesis here and there's no infection and he went home and we did the physiotherapy. Well, that's nothing. Indeed, it's not really the KPI if you are looking at really the outcome. So we are now using PROMs more and more proms to really understand whether we are doing a good job. Uh, And prom is not only on procedure-based, prom sometimes is treating a pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, You are treating pneumonia, fever is down, is going home, is feeling okay, but is not returning to his daily activities, is deteriorated, let's say he's 78 years of age, he has lost activities and is more, let's say. So for me, PROM is very important type of patient engagement. Tell me, how do you feel? Tell me, where have I succeeded and where not? Mm. And this will, it's a kind of feedback that if you think about it, we do not get. Nobody's getting that. Oh, I'm putting my focus on hospital because a hospital is a touch and leave kind of service. A touch and leave. And yeah, we, we do not continuing the care. It's not binding kind of relationship. Mm-hmm. And so this is kind of a, a, an example of, of the importance of patient engagement uh, post-hospitalization. And you also asked these questions before the hospitalization as a baseline. Yeah, but you know, this is usually what you need to do in order to Mm. decide whether you are going to hip replacement or... uh, So so this is obvious. This is part of the diagnosis. This is part of the decision-making. But what happens a week, a month later, it really doesn't uh, being feedbacked back to you. Sometimes you, you call upon him to your outpatient clinics, but the, I'm not sure that really then he is, uh, 
in, in a way, really giving you a feedback. You're just saying, okay, the wound is okay. Yeah, it's six minutes. You're talking about six <laughs> minutes. <laughs> then you're not really getting a large population data of PROMS. Reminds me of a quote from the patient community where they told us, uh, we actually don't want to date you, we want a relationship, right? That's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's the summary. Mm. Great, and then I hope uh, you enjoyed this conversation and this discussion the same as me. I think we are in a very privileged uh, situation as uh, each of us is involved in this and uh, we can really make an impact with our work, with our time. And I think, let's say for me, this is uh, absolutely something that drives me and uh, what makes me wake up in the morning, that we can really hear, see, and then improve our solutions. And uh, I would like to, to thank also the Day One and the Switzerland Innovation for putting this uh, space for this discussion. And uh, I hope that we will, let's say, like not only us, but all, all of the public will uh, push for more patient engagement, that we will uh, have more technology and more uh, solutions. So at the end, we can provide more innovative care for our patients. Thank you so much. I will now Thank hand you. over to Rachel. A few last words from our side. First of all, thank you very much to the great panel, Professor Gamsu for your keynote in the beginning and Florian Gonzalo, Belinda Maria for your, for your really interesting panel. It was, it was great to hear also the different perspectives depending where you're coming from, where you're operating in. Um, second of all, a big thank you to our partners, the Embassy of Israel in Switzerland and the Chamber of Commerce, Switzerland and Israel. Many representatives are here today, also joining us for the opera. We're super excited, very honored to have uh, the ambassador with us today, Ifat Reshel, Reshef, sorry, um, who will give a quick welcome at the opera. So please join us there. Two startups are here today as well, Priyat and uh, Feno AI, who are also very excited to talk to you. So don't leave. Our next event is planned for the 11th of September. Stay tuned. If you want to stay up to date, receive our newsletters, event mailings, make sure to register to our newsletter. Uh, big thank you also again to Novartis for this amazing space and for the opera that we can uh, have every time. If you have a digital health startups, if you know someone in a digital health startups who is looking for space, reach out to me. Super happy to hear from you and yes, enjoy this amazing evening. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.